For example, when Jim introduced me, he he was talking about the partnerships that I created. A partnership is a surrogate. We, uh, limited partners invest in the surrogate in this in this partnership to do a purpose for it. And these were real estate uh, purchases, developments, oil wells. That was a surrogate in order to do something. Now, I as a general partner was controlled by what was called a partnership agreement. And if the general partner gets out of control, the limited partners, the creators, the individuals who create it, can kick me out, put me in jail if I do if I really. Uh, get out of control. So that's what surrogates are. Limited partnerships, corporations, and governments. They're all surrogates that we create. We create those for a purpose, to serve a purpose. But they do not have indigenous power. They are vehicles with, with which we accomplish things. And we are the creators. Think about it this way. Who has more power, the creator or the created? But anyway, who's more powerful? What the person, the, in, the, in, the entity that creates something or the thing that's created? If we create a corporation or a partnership or a union or a government, aren't we the ones that have the power? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But that's been turned around, hasn't it? Very few people understand that we are the ones with the power. So the only true source of power is the individual. Power which is delegated is surrogate power. Now, understanding that difference is absolutely paramount. Surrogates will use force and deception to create the illusion that they have power. That's what we see every day with our government. The only true source of power is the individual. Declaring indigenous power by any surrogate that's out of control is the first step of taking back indigenous power. If I, as general partner, were doing something wrong, and my limited partners declared that they have the power and they're going to take back the power, what does that do for me? Who's it, it reminds me that I'm their servant, doesn't it? And that's the first step. So declaring indigenous power is very, very important. The founders understood this. That's why they wanted a declaration of independence. So they understood this. They understood it at a very deep level. Now let's take let's do this. Let's look at what these guys had in mind when they wrote the Declaration of Independence. Let's look at the first two paragraphs, understanding this concept of indigenous versus surrogate power. This is so critical to understanding our founding documents because these first two paragraphs are the fundamental basis to all of our founding documents. When the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, they're saying, here's the source of our indigenous power. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation citing the source of their indigenous power and citing the importance of declaring it. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator. Again, they're making it absolutely clear where their power comes from. With certain unalienable rights that among these are, they're saying, there's all these rights that we have, but among them are these three. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. There's the purpose. We're going to create this surrogate because we need it. We need it because we want an entity that will help us secure our rights. That's the only purpose of it. That's what it's supposed to do, and nothing else. And we derive our just powers, and, and that, it's, that surrogate is going to derive its powers from the consent of the government. Could it be more clear? They're saying very clearly that this institution that we're creating derives its power from us, the individuals that are creating it that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. Now later, in the, at the end of the Declaration of Independence, it also uses the word duty. It says it's the right and duty to, uh, to alter or abolish a surrogate that becomes out of control, whether it's whatever kind of surrogate it is. It's when we know that power, that our power our indigenous power that we've loaned to some surrogate is out of control. It's our duty to correct that. 
laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So, here's what they did. They created for us a constitutional republic, not a democracy. Because they knew that a democracy is nothing more than mob rule. A good definition of a democracy is three wolves and a sheep sitting down to dinner and deciding who they're going to eat. That's what a democracy all... Be, and our founders clearly understood this, that a pure democracy always ends up in tyranny. Always. So they said they, their intention was to do everything possible to protect indigenous power, to create a bottom-up structure where the power was with the people, with the individuals, at the local level primarily, and that the governments, the in, institutions of government that were further away from the people would be extremely limited and have very little power. That was the concept. So the only kind of entity that can protect indigenous power is bottom-up. So let's talk about this now, the attributes of a bottom-up government. This is also important because I'm, I believe that probably everybody in here will, will be part of this movement to restore our republic. I think it's about the only answer we have right now. I, I hope you'll come to that conclusion tonight. If we're going to restore this republic, we're going to have to make sure the same thing doesn't happen again, aren't we? Yeah. Okay, because it will, and because we're going to talk about power and the nature of power and human beings and power. It will happen if we're not careful. So we need to set it up right right from the beginning. So it's important to understand what bottom-up really means. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to show you a list, actually, of, that I got from a book called Birth of the Chaotic Age. Uh, and this book was written by a fellow by the name of D. Hock. Has anybody heard of D. Hock? He was the chairman of the board and co-founder, excuse me, chairman of the board and founder uh, of Visa International. Uh, he took Visa International in 1968. Uh, it was nothing. It was just a bank. It was, it was uh, an idea of Bank of America. Bank of America, at that point, had a division that they were thinking about starting with credit cards because other credit cards had just started coming out. But they had no idea what to do with it. It was just a headache to them to even think about. But they wanted to find somebody to run it that could take it and, and hopefully do something with it. And they had heard of D. Hock. Some of the people knew him because he had been very successful in other companies. And he said, I'll do it on one condition. You absolutely have nothing to do with me running this company. It's like a separate company. And I do it my way. And they agreed, and they let him go. He created a bottom-up organizational structure that created the most successful company in the world. Within 12 years, it was doing $1.5 trillion in revenue from nothing. And nobody could find the center of it. It was so different than our typical corporate top-down structure that it blew people's minds who looked at it. They couldn't figure out how he did it. It was so bottom-up. But he wrote this book called Birth of the Chaotic Age. He called it a chaotic. In other words, he understood that what he was doing right from the beginning. He was creating something that was bottom-up, that allowed as much freedom as possible, which most people call chaos, with just enough order to hold it together. That's basically what a chaotic is. And the book is phenomenal. I highly recommend it. But this is his list of the attributes of a bottom-up organization. It must not attempt to impose uniformity. And this applies to anything. This could apply to any nonprofit organization or company or government, these principles. It must not attempt to impose uniformity, should be open to all qualified participants. Power, function, and resources should be distributed to the maximum degree. This is critical. Pushing power up to the furthest limits of the organizational structure. No interest should be able to dominate deliberations or control decisions, particularly management. To the maximum degree possible, everything should be voluntary. In other words, they took out the element of coercion from the organization as much as possible. It should introduce, not compel change. And it should be infinitely malleable, yet extremely durable at the same time. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you another list that I got from a book called uh, 5,000 Year Leap. And the 5,000 Year Leap is written by Cleon Skousen. And in there, he talks about what the models the founders looked at and researched. 
in, in terms of how they were going to st structure our government. And the two, the two civilizations they liked the best were the early Israelis under Moses and the Anglo-Saxons. And those two were almost similar, almost very, very similar, almost exactly the same in their structure. And in his book, he lists the attributes. And I want to show you how close they are to the, uh, the attributes that Hawk lists. Equal representation, unalienable rights of the individual, I like uh, unalienable. Doesn't you can say it either way. Either, either way. You're leaving out the eight. I write it that way because that's what they meant. <laughs> unalienable. In other words, you can't lean it. It can't be loaned. It's something that is inherent. Uh, some people say inalienable. Some people want to say unalienable. I say unalienable. So local resolution of problems to the maximum extent possible. Same principle in the other list we just saw. Few laws, those that did exist, were well known by the people. A justice system based on complete reparation to the person who had been wronged. Organized into small groups in which every adult had a voice and a vote. And family units of ten with a leader. With five units of ten families into a fifty unit family, or fifty unit entity with a leader, and so on. That's how it was structured from the bottom up. Now what happened with that? Well, first of all, all the decision-making was pushed to the furthest limits of the organization, wasn't it? All the problems, all the issues, all people that needed help, uh, juvenile delinquency, <coughs> uh, and whatever it was, whatever problem we developed was with, dealt with within the 10-family unit. If it couldn't be resolved there, it went to the 50-family unit. Usually, there was very little to do beyond that. And by the time things got to Moses, they rarely did. They never did. The only thing he had to worry about was foreign relations. Because it was all bottom up. All the decisions were pushed to the local level. So that's how it did it. Now our founders took this and with the structure that was already in the colonies, they structured it basically like this. What you had, oh, well first of all, this is how it looked under, uh, under uh, the Anglo-Saxons and Moses. Uh, with the, um, I'm going to use this thing, I never get to use one See that? That's the base of the pyramid. That represents where the power is, at the base. Up here, very little power. So the, in this bottom-up structure, the power is with the individuals and the families. And very little power at the top. Very little for them to do. That's the bottom-up structure that the founders liked. And so based on that, the basic structure started with our Constitution was this. Again, the power down here with individuals and families. And these st forms of government that were further away from the people were kept very, very limited. State government has a Constitution which limits its power very much, restricts it, Federal government even more. Very specific enumerated powers in the Constitution for the federal government. That's what it's supposed to do, just do those enumerated powers. But they weren't comfortable that people were really going to get the message, so they added the Bill of Rights to it to make it even more in the original preamble, which nobody even sees anymore because they took it out. The original preamble to the Bill of Rights said, and, and just to make sure, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, we're adding these further restrictive clauses. In case you didn't get it, we're saying that these are further restrictions on the federal government. That's what the Bill of Rights is. And the cons Oh! Hey, my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. I can keep going. You guys can see up here, right? Sure. I can see. 